My guest tonight is a law professor at Yale Law School and author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. Please welcome James Foreman, Jr. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Congratulations on winning the Pulitzer Prize. I can see why it was awarded to you and your book, because this is an interesting take on a subject that has really been in many conversations, criminal justice reform, mass incarceration in America. You have tackled it from a slightly different point of view, locking up our own. What does that mean? So I wanted to write a book that put the African-American community front and center. I wanted to write a book with black characters, with black judges, black prosecutors, black police officers, black citizen activists, basically asking the question, in the last 50 years, as America has embarked on this uh, process of incarcerating more and more people, what was happening in the black community? What were the debates that were going on? To show the multiple perspectives, you know, it's not a monolithic, we're not a monolithic community to right. show all of those arguments that were happening. So that's what the book tries to do. And, and you come at this from an interesting place because you worked in the criminal justice system. You worked as a public defender. One of the stories you tell near the beginning of the book is really heart-wrenching, and it's a tale of a black judge who is looking at a young black man who's a defendant, and he says to him, Martin Luther King didn't fight for civil rights for you to go out in the streets thugging. Yeah. And that made you really angry. Why? Well, it did. I mean, my client was charged with possession of a gun and possession of a small amount of marijuana. It was his first arrest. I had a letter from teacher and counselors at his school attesting to his character. His mother and grandmother were there in court. I was asking for him to get a second chance. Right. And the judge gives him this speech where he says, listen, it might, you might think your life is tough now, but let me tell you about what it was like back in the day, back right, in Jim right, Crow. Right. And he reads in this speech. And what, the reason it made me so angry is that I had become a public defender. I was a public defender because I viewed it as the civil rights issue of my generation. So I imagined myself and other public defenders in the Martin Luther King position. And here the judge was flipping it on its head and reading and using this speech along the way towards locking up another young black man. And right. that felt to me just so offensive. Now, what a lot of people may not know, and I, I won't lie, I didn't know it to the depths that it goes into in the book, but a lot of people don't know that in America, many black leaders and many black communities were instrumental in igniting and fueling the war on drugs, the war that went on to incarcerate millions and millions of black men in America and black women as well. This is a, a, a difficult subject for many people to broach because it's black communities, sometimes from top to bottom, that made these decisions. But in the book, you argue that they thought they were doing the right thing. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out that they were constrained in lots of ways, right? They didn't have all the options that were available to them. So they didn't have money for housing, money for education, money for rehabilitation programs. They right. couldn't get national gun control passed. So they're, they, they, they're, they were constrained. But within those constraints, yeah, in many cases, people made decisions that were like the decisions that were made in the rest of America. They made decisions that, um, that, that didn't give people second chances, that lengthened prison sentences, that imposed mandatory minimums. And I wanted, to, I, wanted to, I wanted to show that, but it was important for me while doing that to not in any way suggest that the system wasn't full of racism, right? And that the system wasn't uh, a system that grew out of a history and a legacy of slavery. So right. I wanted to show how both of those things could be true. There could be this historic racism that's still manifesting itself today. Right. And there could have been mistakes that were made by some well-meaning African-American leaders. When, when you speak to those leaders today, if you, if you have the chance to, have any of them expressed their regrets at the decisions they made? Politicians aren't great at, at expressing regret. Right. Um, so some that have stepped out of office have said, you know, we got caught up. Right. It was, it, was an, it was a terrible time, right? The homicide rate tripled in the 1960s in this country, or it tripled in D.C., it doubled nationally. In the crack years in the 80s and 90s, um, it seemed like every day in cities like D.C., New York, Atlanta, Detroit, you know, people were dying, multiple people a day. And, and people... And that, that made communities scared, and that made politicians want to respond. Right. And yeah, they've said 
Some people have said to me we went too far, and some people you can see are now choosing a different approach. Eric Holder is a great example. Right. He's featured in the book as somebody that pursued some of these policies, and now he's really leading criminal justice reform. When you talk about criminal justice reform, though, what does that mean? It seems like a term that's used yeah. broadly, but what are some of the ideas that you genuinely believe would alleviate the problem of having an entire population of some countries incarcerated within the United States? Well, we, so first of all, we have to get rid of mandatory minimums. We have to l shorten prison sentences. Right now, our pr this, the maximum that you can get for most crimes in this country is double and triple what it is around the world. Right. We have to stop putting people, you talked about Meek Mill earlier in the segment, we have to stop putting people on probation for five and 10 and 15 years at a time. And then as soon as they make a mistake, as soon as they miss an appointment with a probation officer, test positive for drugs, we, you have these harsh judges revoking them and locking them up. Right. And we have to take the money that you save save and reinvest it in communities to build the drug treatment programs that we know work if we would fund them adequately, right. to fund the after-school programs that all the research shows work and keep kids out of crime if we fund them adequately. So I actually think we know what to do. It's about building a political constituency to do it. And that is starting to happen. You mentioned in Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, the new DA, he's part of a generation of new district attorneys right. around the country that's saying, you know what? The war on crime has been a failure and we need new approaches. And these are prosecutors saying that. That was unimaginable five years ago. It's, it's interesting that there are some uh, DAs who are stepping up and saying this needs to change. What would you say is possibly the single biggest aspect? Would you say education is the key? Because I, I, I was shocked to, to learn in the book that for young black men who haven't completed high school since the 1960s, they are 10 times more likely to end up in prison just by not completing high school. Is, is that one of the key things that needs to be worked on? Yes, both up front because education keeps people from getting arrested in the first instance for uh -huh. the reasons you just mentioned. But also there's a whole new movement, which I'm a part of, to provide high quality education to people who are incarcerated. Like it's gonna take us a long time Right? Even with some progressive prosecutors, it's going to take us a long time to get out of being the world's largest jailer. Right. And so while we have people incarcerated, let's provide them high quality education because the research shows that for every dollar you invest in education of somebody behind bars, we as a society get $5 in return because crime goes down, recidivism goes down, people are more likely to be employed. So I, I do think education is if you had to pick one thing, and one of my arguments of the book is you can't really pick one thing right, because right, there's right. you know, 50 things we have to do. But if you said, okay, Foreman, yeah, I know, but I've got to focus on one, that's what I would choose. It's a, a, a beautiful book written so well that gives you the origins and the consequences of where we are. And um, it's deserving of every award. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Locking up our own, a fascinating book is available now. James Foreman Jr., everybody.